Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to be able to share with you just a few thoughts on the topic of music in the Church of Ireland in the 19th century and early 20th centuries. I'd like to thank Magella and the Chamber of Wire Ireland and Dr. Stuart Gibson, who's with me somewhere. Hi, in the back, for inviting me to be part of this very interesting series. Following on from Kerry Houston last week, who tantalizingly brought us right up to the year 1799. I'm going to attempt to trace the evolution of Anglican musical style and performance in Ireland through the 19th century and into the early 20th century, with particular reference to the little understood topic of parish church music in that period. Music historians like to divide up periods according to particular trends in musical style, but it's not so easy to do that with church music because church music is, of course, part of a living liturgical tradition. In order to understand the trends in church music, one needs to appreciate the environment in which the music was performed. And the question of environment brings up other issues of liturgical practices and liturgical space. Nowadays, many people's image of the Anglican choral tradition is shaped by this place. The chapel of King's College, Cambridge, which is indelibly associated with the Christmas tide service of nine lessons and carols. Choral worship here features a service which is almost entirely sung by the choir of boys and men who all wear cassocks and surplices, with a formal liturgy and devotional music sung to a high standard. It may come as a surprise that the ubiquity of this distinctive recipe for Anglican choral worship is less than a century old. Every age has its musical and liturgical exemplar. As Kerry mentioned last week, in the post-restoration period, this was the chapel royal of King Charles II. In the era of radio and television, it has been for us King's College, Cambridge. Closer to home, of course, we have St. Patrick's Cathedral. At the beginning of the 19th century, professional choral establishments of some sort existed in most cathedrals in England, Although in Ireland, most cathedrals were located far from population centres and couldn't maintain choirs on quite the same level. Notable exceptions were to be found in Armagh and Dublin. In this period, standards of English cathedral choirs were notably low, even in such places as Westminster Abbey and St Paul's Cathedral. Dublin was unusual, and still is unusual, in having two annual cathedrals. And in addition to that, it also had in the 19th century two collegiate foundations, the Chapel of Trinity College Dublin and the Chapel of Royal Dublin Castle. So within a relatively small city, we had four choirs. And of course, there was much sharing of personnel, as we'll hear about a little bit later. The two cathedrals in Dublin were sometimes said to be, quote, a bright exception to the general rule of the poor quality of cathedral music in this period. One commentator wrote in 1843 that, quote, nothing can surpass their musical skill. And in 1837, an English visitor claimed that he had never heard anthems better sung in any cathedral in England than they are in St. Patrick's. The reason for these unusually high standards, of course, was the age-old attraction of money. <laughs> The Dublin cathedrals offered singers salaries of between £150 and £200. Now, it's very hard to compare the value of money then to the value of money now. There's lots of factors to take into consideration. But that would certainly be more than a hospital consultant, for example, would earn nowadays. These salaries, as you can imagine, attracted some of the finest singers in England to come to Dublin. In England, the average salary paid for cathedral singers was between £40 and £80. Since the times of service didn't clash, it was possible in the early 19th century to hold positions in the choirs of both Christ Church and St. Patrick's concurrently. <laughs> One Englishman, Robert Jager, earned a combined annual salary of £468.11 shillings and eightpence. This is a very interesting uh, a daguerreotype, an early photograph of Robert Jager, which David Caron very kindly provided me with this copy. And he actually is here in the audience and has the daguerreotype if anybody would like to see it. 
right there in the front. <laughs> and this was just recently discovered in uh, David's attic, actually, and it's been sitting there for many years. So very interesting to see what this man looked like. He was already fairly old at that stage because he was born in the 1770s. Um, in this period, weekday choral <coughs> services took place in Christchurch, but not in St. Patrick's, and it was only after the Guinness restoration of St. Patrick's in 1865 that the daily summer services there were restored, which of course ended the possibility of singers coding full-time editions in both cathedrals at the same time. Nowadays, St. Patrick's is the only Anglican cathedral in the world to have both choral anthem and choral union song every weekday. Back to the early 19th century, on Sunday morning, the cathedral choir sang the morning service in Christchurch before reconvening in St. Patrick's for the afternoon service, the weekly musical extravaganza that became known as Paddy's Opera. The beginning of the 19th century was the heyday of Paddy's Opera, as during this period, the cathedral choir boasted a number of exceptional singers. Dr. John Spray was perhaps the most eminent performer of these. His memorial in the cathedral claims for him the grandiose title of first tenor singer in the empire. <laughs> His great friend and fellow lady, Sir John Stevenson, was the most popular Irish church composer of his day, and his no numerous attractive service settings and anthems were staples of the repertoire of both Dublin cathedrals for much of the 19th century. He is best remembered today for his collaboration with the poet Thomas Moore on the collection of Irish melodies. One of the younger generations of singers was John Smith, who came from England to Dublin at a young age, seemingly to live with his uncle, John Spray, who later became his father-in-law when Spray married, when Smith married Spray's daughter, Judith. Smith's service in B-flat major was introduced to the repertoire of St. Patrick's in 1815, when Smith was just 18 years old. A contemporary review of this service stated, a more enchanting service displaying at the same time deep science, excellent taste, and a fine conception of harmony is not to be found among any of the modern productions of church music. High praise for a work by such a young composer. Smith was what you might call a social climber, and um, he did very well for himself, <coughs> for someone who came from a relatively modest background. Smith was very influenced by Handel and uh, claimed that he modeled himself on, on Handel. He, perhaps you could say, peaked too soon, however, as the charm and grace of Cyrus and B flat and quite a lot of inventiveness as well is not really found in his quite prolific later output, which is fairly mediocre and demonstrates a certain indulgence and unself-critical quality in Smith's personality that is very evident elsewhere. He had a very interesting life, and we'd like to talk a little bit more about that, but there's only so much we can fit in today. He enjoyed a very successful career, nonetheless. He became master of state music, master of the King's Band, composer to the Chapter Royal, and eventually, in 1847, the professor of music at the University of Dublin, a position he filled without much distinction. <laughs> <laughs> Parish music, and compared with the cathedrals, the musical standards in parish churches were certainly not as lofty. Service settings, anthems, and such, which were the staples of cathedral repertoire, were rarely heard outside cathedrals and collegiate churches. Only simple music was permitted in parish churches at the beginning and the end of services, not in between. In the early 19th century, some of the wealthier parishes had organs, and some of them employed professional organs, some modest salaries. But in most parishes, music was the responsibility of the parish clerk, a salaried lay person whose duties were to lead the responses in the service and conduct the singing. Few parishes could boast music any more sophisticated than metrical sounds. These were the versified paraphrases of sounds sung to regular rhythmic tunes, which became popular in post-Reformation England through the Sternhold and Hopkins collection, the whole book of sounds collected into English music, which was first published in 1562. This relic of 16th century Protestantism was reprinted many, many times and was still in use in some church of Ireland parishes at the beginning of the 19th century though in most places it had been supplanted by the new version of the Psalms of David, 
published in 1696 by Irishman Nathan Tainter and Nicholas Brady. Metrical sounds were often sung by companies, especially in the less well parishes where there was no order. After 1812, some parish churches began to adopt the collection Melodious Sacra, compiled by David Wayman, who was a leading core of the Dublin cathedrals. This eclectic publication contained settings of all the metrical sound texts to both old and new tunes, as well as some passages from scripture set in simple anthems. Many of these are in the homophonic choral style that we now associate with hymn tunes, although some were written for solo voices and contain imitative contrapuntal writing. <coughs> as a typical example of the highly ornamented style of the collection, We'll sing for you a very short excerpt from Psalm 23 from Melodia Sacra, which was compiled, sorry, which was composed by Wayman himself. <laughs> Nothing's changed, it seems. 
<laughs> at the Easter Vestry of St. George's Parish in 1839, a dispute occurred as to whether it was the duty of the parish clerk or the organist to teach the children to sing. The Vestry ultimately agreed to pay, pay the organist William Walsh to undertake this duty. And this increased Walsh's salary to £75 pounds per annum, which made him the best paid parish organist in Dublin and perhaps in the entire United Kingdom. £75 Irish currency in those days was worth £69, four shillings, seven and a half pounds English currency. And in this period, the wealthy London parishes paid about £40 on average. St. Catherine's Parish Church in Thomas Street appears to have been unusually advanced in respect of congregational singing. In 1830, as well as having acquired charity children trained by the organist, a budget of £15 per annum was allotted for the printing of sounds, presumably metrical ones for congregational singing. <laughs> that St. Catherine's was ahead of its time in this respect in congregational participation in services. may explain why it was the first Dublin city parish to abolish the office of parish clerk in 1837. Outside the wealthier parishes in Dublin city, organs were rare and music was entirely supervised by the parish clerk. At Home Patrick Church in Scaries, in Dublin, the minister and clerk were both accommodated in the once ubiquitous triple decker pulpit, which consisted of a clerk's desk below, above that the reading pew, and above the pulpit. A beautiful example from All Saints Church will be in Norfolk. You can see the pulpit at the top, the clergyman's desk below that, and the parish clerk's desk at the bottom. Can Ernest Drury, who is sometimes presented on St. Patrick's Cathedral, relate to his mother's recollection of the church furniture and the way services were conducted in Home Patrick in the 1850s and 1860s. The parish clerk, in addition to answering all the responses, acted as a presenter and raised the singing with a pitch pipe. There was no other musical instrument, no hymn singing, only the metrical sounds, which in those days were usually printed at the end of Bibles and prayer books, until Wayman's Melodia Sacra began cautiously to introduce certain paraphrases and Methodist hymns, which were at first regarded as objectionable novelties. <laughs> the paraphrases were arrived at the very end of passages of scripture sent as simple anthems. The effectiveness of the parish clerk's efforts in leading congregational singing is questionable, however, as illuminated by the account of Edward Maguire, the Dean of Down, who was ordained in 1845. He said, the clerk had a monopoly of the praises of the sanctuary. His usual preliminary notice was, let us all stand up and sing, in response to which, People did not stand up. <laughs> in the 18th century, some English churches employed a small band of instrumental players, including viols and woodwind, sometimes accommodated in the Western Gallery, which accompanied the singing of metrical sounds. One imagines this sort of accompaniment being far superior encouragement to congregational singing than the lone voice of the clerk and his pitch pipe. There is little evidence of this practice being followed in Ireland, although in 1828 the parish of Castro Pintry in Eden Derry, the Offaly, employs a music master, organ, flutes, and singers at a cost of £20 per annum, an expenditure on music which was noted to be substantially higher than that of neighbouring parishes. You can imagine how different the singers must have been paid if it was £20 for a lot of them. In Feather Church, County Tipperary, in 1843, a visitor was surprised to hear a village choir accompanied, quote, not by the swelling tones of the organ, but by the humble strains of the pianoforte. Parish clerks were pensioned off after the disestablishment of the Church of Ireland in 1871, and with the disappearance of this office, the old tradition of metrical sound had finally died out. As clerks disappeared, parishes began to form choirs of lay volunteers to lead singing, very often under the guidance of the organist. The advent of the harmonium gave less well off parishes an effective and inexpensive means of accompanying the congregational singing. Around 1870, Home Patrick Church purchased a harmonium and formed a choir comprising the sisters of the organist and a couple of school children who sat at the front left hand side of the church beside the harmonium and led the singing of canticles and other items. The singing of prose texts of canticles and psalms to Anglican chants in parish churches. A practice which hitherto existed only in cathedrals was regarded in some quarters with extreme suspicion. In November 1869, 
A public meeting was held concerning the introduction of chanted psalms in St. John's Church, Sandy Mount, which some parishioners claimed was enthusiasm. A pejorative eponym for the innovations of the Oxford movement, named after Edward Pusey, one of the movement's leading figures. One parishioner of St. John's claimed that it is an innovation, and we all know that, unless in high or Puseyite churches the psalms are read. In decent, quiet churches in Dublin, they are not chanted, and we know that innovations of this kind at present are very dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> the Oxford movement began in the 1830s as a movement to restore traditional church doctrines, for example, apostolic succession. Through the subsequent decades, its effects were felt throughout every aspect of church life, particularly in the spheres of architecture, liturgical practice, and music. While styles of cathedral music changed little in this period, huge changes took place in parish music as a result of the effects of the Oxford movement and the work of its followers. One such man was the Reverend Frederick Oakley, who is today best remembered as the author of the hymn, O Come, All Ye Faithful. In 1839, Oakley became vicar of Margaret Chapel in London, where he introduced the settings of the canticle, the psalms, and litany sung by the congregation, then by choir boys attired in white surfaces, a practice hitherto unknown except in cathedrals. The musical settings chosen were simple and devotional in character. Many of them were revivals of the ancient plain song tones adapted to the words of the English prayer book. Margaret Chapel was frequented by many influential people, and the form of service there was imitated elsewhere. <coughs> in 1843, Oakley and his organist, Richard Redhead, published a collection of psalms and canticles set to plain song tones. Oakley's work at Margaret Chapel, however, came to an abrupt end in 1845 when he was suspended from carrying the duties for his avowal of the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. Later that year, alongside his friend and colleague John Henry Newman, he was received into the Roman Catholic Church. Looking back many years later, Oakley noted that the music he introduced to Margaret Chapel was quote, of a more ecclesiastical and varied character than was then even usual in cathedrals. One remarkable contrast with Paddy's opera, where in the same period, the soloists in the anthem ascended the organ loft to deliver their parts in theatrical fashion. The Oxford movement also caused a huge shift in architectural trends throughout Britain and Ireland. The Journal of the Ecclesiologist, published by the Cambridge Camden Society, challenged prevailing trends in both ecclesiastical architecture and liturgical practice, and encouraged the building of new churches in the Gothic revival style of AWM fusion. The preaching house ethos of square gallery churches prevailed in Dublin in the 18th and early 19th centuries. To name a few of the surviving buildings, St. Mary's, St. Catherine's, St. George's, St. Werberg's, St. Anne, St. Michael's, St. Stephen's, these churches all had organs in the West Gallery, with the singers usually placed close by. The ecclesiologists strongly disapproved of this practice and recommended that choir be moved to the east end of the church to reflect their role in leading the liturgy. This change was slow to catch on with the Church of Ireland. Some worshippers considered it to be a form of popery. Charles Villiers Stanford recalled events at St. Stephen's Church in 1868. Quote, I remember a grotesque crowd near the structure of close friendships, which was caused by a very sensible attempt to place the choir in our church, St. Stephen's, near the organ at the East End. This heresy lasted only for one Sunday. There were shrieks of enthusiasm, but the loudest protesters were to be found in the stalls of St. Patrick's the same afternoon. This, however, was only a mild altercation in comparison with the events that took place in St. Bride's Church, Bride Street on the site of what's now the Ivor Trust building near St. Patrick's Cathedral. This poor parish was ministered to by the High Church vicar William Carroll, an uncle of George Bernard Shaw, who was affectionately called Father Carroll by the Roman Catholic inhabitants of the parish. In the early 1860s, Carroll formed a choral union for parishioners to learn to sing, and a surplus choir to sing services, which took a form similar to Frederick Oakley's choral services in Market Chapel in London. Carroll's innovations came to the attention of a gang of ultra Protestant anti ritualists. And on Sunday of April 1866, an enormous mob interrupted 
morning services. At St. Brian's. The newspapers described the extraordinary scene in great detail. During the service, Carol was heckled with cries of no cuties, no popery, no surrender. <laughs> <laughs> One young voice amongst the board, clearly that of an inspiring comedian, shouted, Where's your confession box? <laughs> in the riot, which ensued, church furnishings were damaged, and a copy of the Bible was flung from its stand. After these disturbances, some of Carol's parishioners turned against him. In the face of such opposition, he decided to discontinue his choral services. Buoyed by success in St. Brian's, two weeks later, the anti-ritualist mob turned its attention to All Saints Church for reform, where for two decades prior, the vicar, Dr. William Mashburn, had maintained choral services and high church liturgy, undisturbed by the world at large. The mob, which had so easily rattled William Carroll, proved no match for the vicar of Brain Forum, who George Tyrrell with some affection described as the terrible old doctor. <coughs> As interruptions to the service began, Mashburn addressed the protesters and reminded them of the grave sins they were committing by being, quote, so misguided, so sacrilegious, and so foolish in the house of God as to interrupt God's worship or to insult God's minister. And he reminded them what eternal punishment to waste them for their life. <laughs> and the mob went away from all saints that day and was subdued. <laughs> The high church liturgy and choral services at St. Bride and Grange Gorman were notable exceptions to the largely evangelical aspect of the Church of Ireland in the 19th century. From the 1820s onwards, there was an explosion in the number of so called proprietary chapels or trusty churches. These churches operated outside the parochial system and were usually endowed by local landowners and governed by a board of trustees. In this age of evangelical revival, trustees appointed charismatic young clergymen who attracted large congregations with fiery preaching and lengthy sermons. In the days before television, there wasn't much else to do on Sunday. <laughs> Free from the strictures of the parish system and often with little interference from archdeacons or bishops, many proprietary chapels embraced the non scriptural unity of the Methodist tradition as part of their services, something which was officially forbidden in the worship of the established church. The expansion of Dublin in the 19th century created many new affluent suburbs. The parish churches could not accommodate such large congregations, and many proprietary chapels began to spring up to fill the gap. The first half of the century saw the opening of the Magdalen Asylum Chapel in Beeson Street, on the site of what's now the Sugar Club. The head of the chapel on Farnell, off Farnell Square, which is here shown in its more recent incarnations as a cinema and a wax museum. <laughs> Sanford Chapel, Coleswood near Redwood, the Free Church, Great Charles Street, the Episcopal Chapel, Langley Street, and the Protestant Episcopal Church, Gardner Street, to name a few. Of these churches, the Magdalen Asylum Chapel and the Bethesda both printed collections of hymns of evangelical style for the use of their congregations. The unity of the Methodist tradition encompassed the entire gamut from sublime to, you may say, ridiculous. On the one hand, we had the poetry of Charles and John Wesley, and on the other, the more populist productions of Moody and Sankey, not to mention dear Aunt Fanny, Fanny Crosby. Evangelical hymns in the Victorian era were frequently tended towards sentimentality at the expense of theology, and many people objected to their use of church services. Arthur Patton, the organist of St. Anne's Dawson Street, described such hymns as vulgar, trivial, and ungrammatical. And William Napier's Thackeray, in his diary of his travels in Ireland, described one of the hymns on the Protestant Episcopal Church, Gardner Street, as nonsensical false twaddle. <laughs> the Protestant Episcopal Church later, reading Trinity Church, was synonymous with its famous chaplain John Gray, a notable evangelical preacher who went on to become Bishop of Cork in 1862. Thackeray was not, however, impressed with Craig's preaching. I quote from his Irish sketchbook. The service was beautifully read by him, and the audience joined in, in the responses and in the sounds and hymns with fervor, which is very unusual in England. Then came the sermon. And what more can be said of it than it was extemporary and lasted for an hour and twenty minutes? <laughs> <laughs> the Puritanical influence was strong in Trinity Church. The singing of hymns in the old fashioned style without a continent persisted on 1865 the church finally required an organ. This was not usual in Dublin, however, as other proprietary chapels such as the Bethesda and the Free Church or Angelo Square had organs from the outset. 
It was the proprietary channels that led the way in the spread of non-scriptural unity, which gradually made its way into parish churches also. The publication of the first church hymnal in 1864 was a significant event, as it was the first time that such a collection of hymns was sanctioned for use in parish churches. The editor of this hymnal was the young George William Torrance, who had been educated as a chorister in Christchurch View and went on to be organist of the Bethesda Chapel, organist of St. Andrew's Suffolk Street and St. Anne's Dawson Street, before he was ordained a priest and emigrated to Australia. Torrance's education at Christchurch Cathedral and subsequent work as an organist of proprietary chapels and parish churches demonstrates the mobility of church musicians in Dublin between these strands of 19th century ecclesiastical life. Torrance was not alone in this. His teacher at Christchurch was William Richard Beattie, himself a former cathedral chorister, who for five decades held concurrently the positions of Master of the Boys at Christchurch and Organist of the Free Church. During that time, he managed to moonlight as organist of both St. George's Parish Church and St. John's Chandler Street. So the sharing of personnel, it was unsurprising that musical materials cross fertilized. Another protege of Beatty's was Robert Stewart, later Sir Robert, who was perhaps the most renowned Irish musician of his generation. He was appointed organist of Christchurch Cathedral and Trinity College in 1844 at the early age of 19 and subsequently became organist of St. Patrick's Cathedral and the Dublin University Professor of Music. For five decades, he was a towering figure in Irish musical life, and his abilities as an extemporizer were admired by organists throughout Europe. His visits to Paris and to the Wagner Festival at Bayreuth gave him a cosmopolitan musical taste which helped to overcome some of the insularity of the Irish musical scene. Last week, Kerry mentioned how the job of making a choral was more highly respected than that of organist. It was also much better paid. In 1861, Stuart resigned as organist of St. Patrick's in order to be appointed a half vicar choral. Even half the salary of vicar choral was more than the salary of the organist. I think the organist had 100 pounds and the vicar's choral had 240 pounds at that period. Stuart continued to pay for services unofficially, however, as his successor, <coughs> William Murphy, recognized that Stuart's talents as an organist greatly surpassed his abilities as a singer. Sir Robert wasn't at all immune from the bad behavior during the services, for which today vicars became notorious in the 18th century, which Kerry told us about last week. During the services, his pupils and hangers on gathered around the organ console, which was in those days just behind the choir stalls to the left of the high altar. And they kept up an incessant conversation, except when Stuart was actually playing the organ. Canon Drury, the presenter, recalled that dirty jokes were not unknown amongst this party. Further evidence that nothing had really changed. <laughs> <laughs> Stuart's surviving compositions are few in number, but they're marked by a contrapuntal rigor that demonstrates his mastery of composition in historic styles, as well as its strong influence on Mendelssohn. While on the subject of Sir Robert Stewart, here's a little curiosity that I couldn't resist including the sound chant included in his edition of what later became the Irish chant book. <laughs> Yeah. 
midway between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism. Trench's influence on parish music was that he created many new parish churches which stemmed the flourishing of the proprietary chapels. One of the new parishes he created was St. Bartholomew's, which opened in 1867. It was built with a large chancel with stalls for circus choir, the organ nearby, the Manhattan Western Gallery. The choir had more than 20 singers, boys and men, and they sang at services playing some psalms, settings of canticles, and settings of the communion service by contemporary composers such as John Mathis Dykes and Sir Arthur Sullivan. The singing of communion services in this period was quite rare even in cathedrals. Another notable center of music in Dublin was St. Stephen's Mount Street, already mentioned, where the organist was Dr. William Gator, who served the parish for more than 50 years. When Gator was appointed in 1876, the services were of what he called the old fashioned type, with the sounds red. By the beginning of the 20th century, St. Stephen's had choral services twice every Sunday and an impressive repertoire of anthems. By the beginning of the 20th century, almost every church in Dublin had some manner of choir to lead the singing of hymns and psalms. The prejudices of earlier times against choral music in parish churches had faded somewhat, and the boundaries between different styles of liturgical music gradually began to break down. <coughs> As a result, parish church music gradually became an eclectic amalgam of different styles, featuring non-scriptural hymnody, chanted psalms, and in some cases, anthems and cathedral style service settings. Although musical taste and liturgical practice has evolved considerably in the intervening century, the same diverse approach still characterizes parish music today. I hope you've enjoyed this afternoon's talk, which has just been a small look into cathedral and parish music in the periods during which Ireland was part of the United Kingdom. For those of you interested in exploring this area further, I put together just a very short list of some of the sources which I've referred to and some other things that might be interesting. <laughs>